Welcome to Mindshift, I'm Brandon. I'm interrupting my normal spiel to say that I finished recording the video just now and I want you to watch it. I want you to watch it all the way through. I want you to comment, I want you to like, I want you to share. Yes, it benefits me. It's not for that today. You guys do great with most videos. I want this to be my number one video. I hadn't watched all of Vlad's video before I started making this video. And now that I'm through it, and now that I've given all of my responses, I am so sure that this is one of the biggest issues in Christianity and one of the most harmful things for the individual that I am asking you to help me make this my best video. So watch it all the way through. Please do all the things. Let's see if as a community, those of you who agree with me in trying to reduce the harm of Christianity can help me make this video bigger than most. With that out of the way, my normal intro would be, this is a Tuesday takedown, but not of people, but of bad ideas bad apologetics, and bad arguments, all of which we're getting from Vlad Savchuk today. His video is on eight ways to discern the difference between the voice of God or the Holy Spirit and ourselves or the deceitfulness of the devil. I thought it was just going to be stuff like read your Bible more, and it was, that was point one, and then it got way worse. And like an epiphany, I saw so clearly not how corrupt Vlad or his teaching is. I think he's being as genuine as he can be here. And Vlad, I'd love to have a conversation with you. But in trying to follow the Bible and make excuses for when God isn't speaking or the confusion that we have when trying to listen to him, it showed the litany of issues that come in with Christian apologetics. And so I have a level of passion and hype right now that is probably going to seem very weird when we start playing the normal part of the video but I wanted to say my piece. Please watch this one. Thank you for being here. Here's the rest of the video. Now, I've only listened to his intro and the first two points, and I thought, yep, we're going to talk about this. So six of them will be brand new to me also. It's a 23-minute video. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm going to try to use my own discernment to show you the parts that matter, not take him out of context, and reply to those. If you want to see the full version, though, it is listed in the description down below. So without further ado, let's watch his intro. The Bible makes it very clear that it's possible to be deceived by your feelings. It's possible to be driven by your feelings and feel a sense of urge and impulse and those things might not be from the Lord. In fact, they could be contrary to the Lord. Your feelings are important to God. He created them and God can use your feelings, your emotions and your thoughts to communicate but also they could be a channel by which the enemy can draw you into sin and disobedience. The main point that I'm showing you from his intro is what I think is extreme confusion. Hey, listen, your feelings don't matter, but God made your feelings and they do matter. And God will communicate to you sometimes through your feelings, but those feelings can also be very deceitful and can get you in a lot of trouble if you can't understand the difference. How ridiculous of a setup is it to have a God that creates us with feelings that are so incorrect, so open to interpretation and manipulation, and even that he gives his enemy, our enemy, a force way greater than ourselves, supposedly, the ability to control and manipulate those feelings while also simultaneously using them to communicate with us. That would be like if I just built a highway for cars to go on and I didn't put any lanes and I employed a terrorist group to as often as they felt like attack this highway. But it was also the only way that I was going to allow people to get to any sense of freedom or pleasure or anything good in their life. We could stretch that analogy a lot further, but it's an absolutely stupid and ridiculous concept. If God wanted to make sure we could hear from him clearly, he should have kept the devil off the line. It's that simple. You can still give us free will. You can still give the devil dominion over this earth without allowing him into our thoughts and feelings. Like, does anyone step back and just think about how ridiculous that really is? But then he goes on to say this, the last part of the intro, and then we'll get into his eight points. Hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is not a skill to be acquired. It is a sense to be sharpened. You don't have to be taught how to hear. You just have to learn to discern and sharpen your sensitivity to discern the voice of your parents from the voice of strangers. Therefore, hearing God comes natural if we are born-again Christians. First of all, he gives the caveat, if you're really a true born-again believer, which is how many of you are going to discount what I'm saying, even though I believed as much as anyone can believe for 30 years. Well, if you're here now, Brandon, you obviously never really believed. Again, an argument for another day. But supposedly, real born-again believers will have access to hearing the Lord, just like a child has access to hearing their parents. It almost feels too elementary for me to point out the ridiculousness of this statement. Comparing God 
with a parent fails because parents show up. There's something to map that voice onto. I know I've been using that term a lot. I think I listened to too much Jordan Peterson lately. There's something to map that onto though, right? My daughter looks at me, she sees me, she sees the words coming out of my mouth and she can say, that voice is my father's. How confusing would it be if she was blind and every single person that ever communicated with her for her entire life sounded the exact same. And when she gets rightly confused, if it's me speaking or someone with the intent to deceive her who is her mortal enemy. How unfair would it be for me to say, uh, hello, I'm over here. I'm the real one. Why aren't you following me? Why aren't you listening to me? That's incredibly unfair. If you're going to use this analogy, at least admit to the differences. God does not physically show up and the voice of God can supposedly sound just like the voice of the devil or of your own internal thoughts. I think in addition to the Tuesday Takedown playlist, we'll put this in the Christianity is Confusing playlist. And I'm really excited to see what points he makes other than these first two. The first one is the Holy Spirit's voice aligns with the scripture while emotions many times contradict the scriptures. So when it comes to my emotions, my thoughts, they many times can contradict the scriptures and they could actually pull the scripture out of context. That's why the Holy Spirit, He doesn't do that. He wrote the scriptures and He will guide us in the way that lines up with the whole console of the scriptures and he helps us to understand the scriptures as well. My thoughts, mm, they could be confusing because you can use the scripture of Solomon had many wives and you can use that scripture to say, well, it's completely fine for me to have an adultery in my marriage. And that's taking scripture out of the context. Okay, so point one here is that it needs to align with scripture. And this is probably the most common thing I've heard in the history of being a Christian for how you know when it's God speaking to you, because it will be the same as what you read in scripture. And if this whole thing were true, I think that would be generally good advice, but it's not true. And the scriptures are not consistent. And that's where things start to get tricky. So I'm going to paraphrase for you the rest of the parts that I didn't show you. His whole point here is actually good Christian advice. Hey, don't just do the chance thing and open it up and then read that and say, that's what the Holy Spirit wanted to tell me. I think that's juvenile and amateur, even assuming this God were real. And also make sure that you're taking that scripture in context. Couldn't agree more. And then he states that comparison with Solomon. Well, if you open up the Bible and you read that Solomon had 700 wives, should you have an affair or get into polygamy? And yes, if you're just looking at that, you could have that out of context and it would be bad advice, except that God does allow and even bless people in the Bible with multiple wives. And Vlad goes on to point out that we can see the original plan by looking back in Genesis about one man and one woman. So we're not even talking about some new covenant, old covenant thing. We're looking at the Old Testament. He's saying just because Solomon had more wives doesn't mean you can too. And then he points to a verse in Genesis to show what's really supposed to be the case. I will put it to you that there are good Bible believing Christians. They're usually part of a different denomination who pray to God for discernment, who really believe that it is correct for them to have have multiple wives. And then they turn to the scriptures and they take it in context and they look through and they see all the blessings, all the men that have all of these wives and how God was okay with it and ordained it. And they make a decision to have multiple wives. And Vlad would find them sinning. He would find them cherry picking. He would find them taking that verse out of context for their own purposes, their own selfish desires. Meanwhile, he just cherry picks the verse in Genesis. And yeah, it's more common in Christianity to have that belief. I understand. But you can make a case for both from the Bible. And that's my whole point. I'm not advocating polygamy. I'm advocating that a good God-fearing, Bible-reading, Holy Spirit-dwelling Christian can read that Bible and get many different answers to many different questions, all while being consistent in the word. So again, this would be great advice if this God really existed and if his word was consistent and non-contradictory. But you can list any subject. If you want to try this and play along at home, go ahead, put it in the comment section, any topic, and I can make a case pro or against from the Bible for almost all of them, unless you're getting highly specific with something that only exists today in technology, blah, blah, blah. The Bible doesn't have anything to say about AI. But if you're talking about divorce or abortion or slavery or murder or war or corporal punishment or capital punishment, I can give you good verses in context that make a case for or against. So if you're trying to make decisions in your life and you are relying on waiting on the Lord as one is told to do, and then you are trying to discern correctly if that is indeed from the Lord, so you are fact checking it with scripture scripture, you are going to get massively different results. That's incredibly problematic. And then he ends point one by saying this. I'll reply to that and we'll move on to point two. I trust not in my ability to hear the Holy Spirit. I trust in his ability to communicate with me. That's one of those things that to a Christian sounds so pretty and so enlightening. Yeah, 
I don't have to take the burden of this. It's not my ability to hear. It's God's ability to communicate. But if you inspect this further, it's insane. First of all, this is not consistent with everything Vlad just said, because there's so many things we're supposed to do to make sure we're discerning correctly, that we're listening appropriately. So you can't just put the responsibility back on God. If I just told my wife, hey, you know what? I'm not going to worry about like getting good at listening to you or understanding you because I know you're such an excellent communicator that you will communicate perfectly to me and I will always understand what you intend because of you not because of me. And I get it's not a perfect comparison because the Christian will say, yes, but God is already perfect. If he's already perfect, then there should already be perfect communication if that's what he wants. And he does say this. He says he's not the author of confusion. He says we can know him and we can hear him. And every single Christian, I dare anyone to say this is not true. Every single Christian will say there are people that think they're hearing from the Lord and are not, or they get deceived, or they got it wrong, or they let sin or sickness or whatever get in the way. So if we are are able to not hear from him, and it's not on us to get good at doing so, then where's the fault? It's on the Lord. There's nowhere else that it can be. You can't have this both ways, Vlad. You can't say, here's eight things to do the work to make sure you're discerning, but don't worry. You don't have to get good at this. God's already perfect at it. No, he is not, which is why you as a Christian are having to educate other Christians on how to fill the gaps, because we've clearly seen this be used and abused. People have done horrible things in the name of God, and they really believe they were hearing from the Lord. And there's lesser cases, people make bad decisions every single day while believing that this is what the Lord has for them. It's a sickness. See my video on prayer. And the Christian will say, yeah, it can be really, really messed up. That's why we have to get so good at that. That's why people like Vlad are so important. That's why the discernment is so needed. But it never gets better, does it? It's always corrupt. Maybe the person on the other end of the line isn't there or isn't good. Something to think about. We're going way too slow for this video. Let's move on to point two. The second thing is the Holy Spirit's voice is divine. Our emotions and thoughts, they rise more from our biology, our experiences, past traumas, and sometimes even present circumstances. The origin of your emotions are not always divine. They're deeply influenced by your circumstances, your upbringing. God's voice, on the other hand, has a divine source. It's not based on human circumstances or psychological reactions, but on the eternal truths and God's will. So I'm not actually 100% sure what to say about this. It's just a weird doubling down on how faulty we are. And I agree. Oh my gosh, we are so faulty. We have so many biases. We have a plethora of emotions that are tied to real things and also to fears or hypotheticals. If you've ever done any amount of mindfulness meditation and you see the barrage of thoughts that come at you and you don't know where they're coming from, why they're coming, they're saying all kinds of things like it's insane what's happening in our brain and poetically in our heart. I get that. Feelings, emotions, thoughts, they're all faulty or can be. And we can get better at learning how to think and how to observe and how to critically work our way through these things. That's a lot of what I hope to help people be able to do through this channel. But we're not perfect. So Vlad and I agree there. But what he's saying is there is something that's perfect. There is the divine. And the Holy Spirit, when communicating with you, is divine. He is not subject to these faulty emotions. Cool. And we have nothing to worry about, right? Wrong. Because you're making a video about it, Vlad. If it was as simple as we have organic processes that are faulty, but God is perfect and so his process is perfect, we wouldn't have the need for this. It's almost like we need a sixth sense, a little Holy Spirit radar beep that we can detect, oh, incoming message, this one's from the Holy Spirit, but God didn't give us that. We have all the same organic properties at our disposal that we do for the rest of our flawed series of emotions, feelings, and thoughts. So you can say, well, he's divine and the message will be divine, but it's coming in through very organic and faulty systems. And once there, it's indistinguishable from everything else. That's the problem. And again, I know I'm hypothetically speaking like this God is real and that the Holy Spirit is actually communicating with us. I'm playing around in his playground here. I often get comments where people are like, it sounds like you believe. What? But I digress. Point three. The third the third distinction that we need to keep in mind is the Holy Spirit's voice is consistent, whereas emotions, they fluctuate. Therefore, you cannot take emotional cues always, oh, this must be God speaking. The voice of the Holy Spirit is consistent. There's stability that's involved in that. Uh-oh. Okay. I'm fearing that what's going to happen with the rest of these points, because this is the first time I'm hearing this point, is that Vlad set up the need for this video. Hey, it can be hard to distinguish between our own thoughts and the Holy Spirit. But now, every 
everything that he seems to be saying is that it shouldn't be hard, right? If it's in scripture, we know. If it's divine, we know. Whatever the hell that means. And now he's saying, if it's consistent, we know. No, we don't. And well, furthermore, the clip that I showed you from this, I mean, he explains this in a little more detail than I am, but he goes on to give the example that, hey, maybe the emotions are high. We feel like we're hearing from God. So let's not act on it just yet. Let's journal it. And this is good advice, by the way, in general, you know, even before making a big purchasing decision or a big life commitment, like take some time with it. But when you try to connect it to the biblical, the spiritual, I think it really falls down because listen to what he says. The way I test, whether it's my emotions or the voice of the Holy Spirit, I just wait for a few days. And so Sometimes next day you wake up, you're like, I totally don't feel very strong. I don't think this is even from God. Those are more emotions. You didn't get any new information. Your emotions fluctuated. It feels like we're saying the same thing, but we're having very different interpretations here. So when you had the high emotion and you were excited and you thought it was from the Lord, that's wrong. That's a bad emotion. But when you wake up and you're feeling calm and you get the feeling that you were wrong yesterday, that emotion is true. Shouldn't we journal that emotion and wait a few days for that? Like, where does it end? And you can know this is problematic because listen to the very last thing he says here. And the time kind of fluctuates those emotions and God's voice is consistent because you will wake up next day and you still feel strong about it because it's originated from God's source. So time brings stability. And so when we wake up the next day, if we still feel the same way, that must be God because it's consistent? What horrible advice. Vlad, I don't know if you know this, sometimes certain feelings, thoughts, emotions last longer than 12 hours. You might pray about something, feel like you're feeling something, wait, sleep on it, wake up the next morning, still feel the same way. That doesn't automatically mean God. That means this particular feeling wasn't as fleeting as the rest. Is that really how you're going to make the decisions for if and when God, the creator of the universe, is talking with you because it lasted a certain number of hours? How many of you have ever changed your mind, thought you were right about something, waited two or three days, felt consistent, and a month later you were like, what a mistake. If this is your little formula to find out if God's speaking, if it holds up over the test of time, time being 12 hours, 15 hours, a day, two days, whatever number you want to feel comfortable with, that's delusional. So we're in all new territory. Let's move on to the fourth point here. The fourth thing is the voice of the Holy Spirit guides us according to God's will, but our emotions reflect our internal state. God's voice isn't necessarily interested in guiding you into your perfect prosperity, your perfect health, but God's perfect will. Your but emotions typically tend to be selfish in nature. They tend to be things that are immediately benefiting my external life. It's not the primary goal of the Christian life. And so emotions will always protect you from the challenges. They will always guide you toward the things that are comfortable, safe and easy and convenient. And they reflect, you know, your desire for a safety. Holy Spirit's voice is more attached, glued and draws us toward God's perfect will. This is very dangerous. And let me explain how. Another way of interpreting this, and I don't think it would be unfair, is to say we can know it's God if it's something that we don't want to do. And I don't think Vlad's trying to make that big of a case. He did give some nuance, and I'm not sure how much of this I just played for you. So I want to be fair, but I don't think you can have both ways. I don't think you can add in all this nuance, and sometimes God will align for you, and sometimes God does have this for you, and he does desire for these earthly pleasures for you. But if you're feeling like that, then that's probably just you. Like this is an incredibly confusing thing. And I I think so many Christians to err on the side of caution, which good on that, you know, they're trying to follow their beliefs, but to err on the side of caution, they're saying, okay, I'll just get in this mentality of denying myself. I can't trust myself. You know, we have the verses, Jeremiah 17, nine, I think I could be wrong, is the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know? God's claiming he's the only one that can know the heart because if you go on into verse 10, it's horrendous. That's where he judges the heart and the mind and rewards or punishes accordingly. Gross. But Christians, again, erring with our sinful nature, Nature, they start to deprive themselves. They start to only hear things that are anti-self. And so the whole formula, I think, is broken here. But the dangerous part is that the Christian will just continue to deprive themselves, give more and more of their money away. They will have unhealthy boundaries with their family. They will be manipulated and taken advantage of until they have nothing left for themselves or even to give to others. It is a destructive pattern. I have seen it. That's the harm that can come with taking these things to the extremes. Where's that voice of balance? If you're only aligning yourself with God's will, God's will is not for you to prosper. It is for you to be an enemy to those of this world. It is for you to lose here on earth, but gain in heaven. It is to deny yourself and pick up your cross. That's just bad earthly advice, period. And since this is all we have, it is a big deal. But I'm going on a huge diatribe. Let's move on. To point five. The fifth thing is the Holy Spirit's voice is reliable. 
in other words, trustworthy. My emotions can be very deceptive by the enemy, by the circumstances and by our own flesh. The Bible actually makes it very clear in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. The enemy would strategize to make you depend on your emotions 100%. He can completely rule your life if your life is based on your emotions. There are people who would leave their families and go into a full-time ministry. People who would leave their spouses and go marry someone else because they felt a strong word from God, totally ignoring God's word and find themselves in very deep deceptions. There are people who sometimes Sometimes we'll feel led to empty their bank accounts. It could be just your thoughts, it could be just your emotions. First of all, hilarious because I felt like he heard what I just said and countered it or tried to counter it and it's ridiculous. Also, I feel like he's being completely hypocritical to everything he just said. Point five is that the Holy Spirit is reliable and emotions can deceive. If the Holy Spirit is reliable, then emotions can't deceive. It's that simple. How could I ever get the Holy Spirit confused with my emotions if the Holy Spirit is being reliable. The entire point of this video is that we can't rely and he's going to say, well, we can't rely on our own interpretation of the Holy Spirit. What else is there? What a nothing statement. And he already tried to say this with the other point about you know, the Holy Spirit being divine and our emotions being subject to organic responses. All he's continuing to do is putting God and the Holy Spirit in this perfect column. And that's how we can know that what we're hearing is the Holy Spirit because He's perfect and everything else is not. What? How does that help us? He had to have even heard how ridiculous it all sounded because at one point he says, I'm not trying to confuse anybody. And he even sees the ways that this can go in the wrong direction, right? I, we almost used all the same examples. I promise I did not watch this before doing this, talking about how you can spend too much money or you can end up living incorrectly. You can hurt yourself by trying to align yourself in this. But didn't he just tell us in the previous point that those things would not be of the spirit? Like, I am baffled at what he thinks he's communicating here. The problem with not watching videos and not scripting and doing most of what I do off the cuff is that I often try to come up with analogies really quick and sometimes they're kind of ridiculous. I'm trying to think of like a way to show you the insanity of this. Let's say that there, this is so stupid, a perfect apple pie. It's the real deal. It's the only perfect apple pie in the world. It has the crust to apple ratio down. It has the correct way to cook the apple so it's not too chewy but not too runny. It's perfect. Meanwhile, there are a billion other apple pies and your job is to know when you have finally tasted the perfect apple pie. The problem is there's another baker who's almost as good as the one who made the perfect apple pie and he is putting in front of you billions of near perfect apple pies. And you turn to me and say, any advice? Because I have to get the right apple pie. The others are literally poison. And I say to you, don't worry, the real one is perfect. Now, I don't know if that analogy is going to stand up, but I think that it's almost as ridiculous in terms of advice about this particular problem for the Christian. Man, if only God could just come down and clear things up. I'm sure I've said this a billion times already, but can you just imagine a perfect creator of the universe? We'll even allow for the fact that he's going to allow this deity to try to purposely deceive us, to act like him, which is what the Bible says. Couldn't this God still have given us some perfect divination. What could be more important? It want to interrupt our free will. I mean, God's already interrupting our free will, if you think about it, on the basis of he's communicating with us. That's not just starting up the universe and letting it play out. The whole point is we believe he's actively intervening in our life and we want to correctly see when it's him versus when it's not. So having some metric within us that allows us to always line up with that Seems like a pretty good idea, right? Are you telling me this God was incapable of doing that? If he was capable of doing it and didn't, and knew that not doing it would allow for deceit that would take us away from him, right? Like my soul's on the line, according to this religion. I'm going to go to hell forever, according to most of you, because I was deceived when you weren't. Because even though I probably have spent more time in the Bible than you, which is the number one way we're supposed to know God's voice, the devil got a hold of me. God's cool with that setup. You're cool with that setup. It could happen to you next. Don't you realize that? You can believe whatever you want about me, but I promise we are no different. You read the Bible, you go to church, you pray, you have devotions, you're doing it all right, you've got the right salvation doctrine, you're open-minded or you're closed-minded enough, whatever you think you're supposed to be doing. You're fundamentalist enough, you're progressive enough. The arrogance to think that you are somehow doing Christianity correctly in a way where you will never be the one who gets deceived. While someone like me, who thought I was just like you, ended up here. So let me try to 
break through that really quick to you. It's a messed up system that you believe in. It's unfair and it's unjust. Okay, let's continue. Point six, we're getting there, guys. Number six, responding to the Holy Spirit's voice requires faith. Managing your emotions demands self-awareness. When the Holy Spirit speaks, faith is required. When your emotions are raging, you have to become self-aware and you have to regulate them. I am not saying to ignore emotions. We have to pay attention to them because while they sometimes might not be the voice of God or the voice of God is not coming through our emotions, emotions can be huge indicators of what is happening inside of us. I'm going to cut this off here at this point. There's more that we'll listen to. But again, I think this is really harmful advice. He's saying we we need to be able to manage our emotions. We need to be able to be aware of our emotions. This is the problem with believing in the devil and the power that he has. If we can be deceived, what makes you think you can manage that deceiving? If you could manage it, you wouldn't be deceived in the first place. You either have to believe that our emotions are truly out of our control because the devil has power in corrupting them. He can completely rule your life if your life is based on your emotions. Or you believe that they are natural and organic processes that we can get better at managing. You can't have this both ways. But I would argue that many Christians, especially those who have the belief in the devil and his ability to corrupt and deceive, are the ones who don't manage their emotions, are the ones that are least mindful, are the ones that are most adverse to good cognitive behavioral therapies, etc. because of that belief. Oh, no, oh, I can't trust myself. I can't trust my emotions. The devil can be higher than all of that. The only thing I've got is God. So they stuff the emotions down or they call an emotion that needs to be dealt with the devil. It's not the devil. It's anxiety. It's not the devil. It's depression. It's not the devil. It's confusion. It's not the devil. It's childhood trauma. Calling it the devil and putting it in this box prevents you from dealing with it, prevents you from understanding it, being aware of it, and managing it appropriately. This is the thing I would hang my hat on over everything is that Christianity is so horrendous for our mental health. And it's because if you believe it to any degree, it's inherent baggage of the devil or demons or evil or whatever you're more comfortable with, depending on how far on the progressive scale you are, interrupts your ability to believe in your autonomy to handle what's really going on inside yourself. But Brandon, I'm a Christian. I believe in the devil. I believe we can be deceived, but I also believe in science and mental health and neurochemistry. I go to a Christian counselor. We talk about real things like healing my childhood trauma, and I can still maintain my faith in God. Great. You're further along than most, and you're also doing it despite the Bible, not because of it. All of those things, even if Christians have adopted them as their own, were not important or real to God. All sickness, all mental health was an unclean spirit, was the devil, was the consequence of sin in your life, was a punishment, or was a deceit. There's no recognition of this soft in-between understanding our biology and our evolutionary purposes and dealing with those things outside of the realm of the spiritual. It was all spiritual. So I am so glad that Christianity has advanced in some respects and in some groups and in some denominations for some people to allow them to start having the proper tools to deal with this despite their current belief system. But it is just that. It is a foregoance of really adhering and believing in the fullness of what the Bible speaks. But again, I'm so glad for it. I don't want people to be trapped by their trauma and their emotions and their feelings. But I know personally so many Christians who are, and it's because of this belief system. And it's because of what Vlad is saying here. Let's let him continue on with point six though. So how do I know where it's the voice of God and it's the voice of me? My voice requires no faith. God's voice requires faith. And so when it requires faith, it's the Holy Spirit. Blah, gross. It got worse. God will never ever communicate anything to you that doesn't require you to take it on faith. It sounds like God is only saying insane, unproven, non-repeatable, non-understandable things to you. Faith is a crutch for when things don't make sense or don't add up. He is essentially telling you right now, you have to be stupid and gullible. And that is when you will hear from God. When you can't reason your way through it. But if it's something that you have to manage your emotions through, that's not God. What? Let's move on to point seven. The Holy Spirit's voice has God's backing or support. My emotions lack supernatural providence. That means when God's Spirit speaks, a lot of times you will sense His guidance. Does it happen all the time? 
No, but does it happen a lot of times? Yes. You will sense things lining up. When the Holy Spirit doesn't speak and it's just your emotions, a lot of times what you experience is lack of supernatural providence. You almost feel like you're pushing things uphill. Now sometimes that push and resistance could be demonic and you will sense that in your spirit. But sometimes it's just God pretty much confirming and saying, hey, I'm not speaking. I'm not leading. Maybe it's your emotions because emotions lack supernatural guidance. God's voice does not. I'm going to lose my mind. Vlad, can we have a conversation? I mean it. I will be as respectable. I will listen as much as I speak, if not more. I want to understand how you justify this. All you're saying here is don't rely on your emotions. Do rely on your emotions, right? It's an emotional thing to feel like you have God pushing you. That's a feeling that is as open to interpretation and corruption as everything else you just warned against. When you don't feel this or you do feel that, sometimes God will be doing this, but sometimes he will be doing that. You are saying nothing. I encourage everyone to go back, watch the full number seven here and try to make heads or tails out of what he is actually, like what practical, applicable advice can the Christian do with this information? All we've been told through this whole video is how corruptible and untrustworthy our emotions are. And he is saying here, there are more emotions that can come on top of other emotions that will let you know sometimes, but not always, that God is indeed moving here. And if you don't feel other things, so a lack of feeling, which can only be interpreted through other feelings, the lesser feelings will indicate something else to you. It's all subjective. It's all open for interpretation. You've only muddied the waters for Further, you've added no real clarity, and all you've done is show exactly how inept this God is with his plan of communicating with his creation. This is wholly ridiculous. Number eight. Number eight. The Holy Spirit whispers usually. Emotions can be very loud and impulsive. You know, the Bible says in 1 Kings 19, 12, that after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, it was a still small voice. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't yell. He's not pushy. He leads and he whispers. Psalm 23 verses 2 and 3, it says, He makes me lay down at green pastures, leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. You don't see, pushes me, forces me, and those could be the pushings of the enemy. And so it's important that we don't make drastic decisions based on our emotions. Could God use that sometimes? Yes. If God's voice calms, Satan's voice obsesses. If God's voice comforts, Satan's voice worries. If God's voice convicts, Satan's voice condemns. Remember, God wants to speak today. He wants you to distinguish his voice from the voice of your thoughts, emotions, and the enemy's voice. <sighs> I haven't been this genuinely upset by a video in a long time. And you would think that there would be topics that would do it to me more like hell or when people make excuses for slavery, etc. But this is so indicative of the Christian's daily life and the harm that comes with that, even when they don't think it's harmful. And I see it so clearly. And I think that's why it's so upsetting. There are so many things going on in point eight here and I didn't play, I'm sure I'm not gonna play you the whole part because it's it's very long, but let me paraphrase a few parts for you and, and react to a few here. First of all, I think in almost every single point, Vlad has tried to say, this is how you'll know. And then he gives a caveat. And in this case, it's, it will always be a still soft voice. It will always be a quiet nudge instead of a forceful push. But could God sometimes speak in the larger ways? Yes. Well, <laughs> then it doesn't mean anything. The other thing I'm noticing that he's doing here is I, and I, I think, I think I'm starting to see how he's doing his videos. He looks at a verse and then talks about that verse. And he doesn't take the time to consider that there's another verse that says the opposite or that this verse says different than the verse he used for the last point. So an example, of this is he's saying, well, hey, in 1 Kings, we hear God speaks in a quiet whisper. Also in 1 Kings, we have God speaking directly to people, like tangibly or through prophets. Why did God give up on those two systems? Right? You can't just pull one of three types of communication out of 1 Kings and say, this is how he's doing it. The only reason you're saying that is because the other two are so obviously not true. Then he goes into Psalms and he says, Look, God leads David to lie down these passive, gentle things to prove his point that God is the still small spirit. Have you forgotten the rest of Psalms? God spoke very loudly to David when he was murdering David's son for David's affair. That is not a still, small, passive voice. And then he goes on to give an example of the Israelites when they didn't have God before battle were very loud and hyped up. See, that's us. That's our sinful nature. God is that quiet voice. Except for all the times that God's voice was 
deafening to the enemies, blowing trumpets and stomping around until the walls fell down and crushed innocent women and children in Jericho. That was God being boisterous and loud. That was God adding hype. This goes back to what I said in point one. You can't get consistency from this Bible. So giving consistent advice from this Bible is impossible and thus problematic. I could go on forever on this topic. But what is the last thing he does here? Let me replay this so we can talk about it. If God's voice calms, Satan's voice obsesses. If God's voice comforts, Satan's voice worries. If God's voice convicts, Satan's voice condemns. Holy cow. No, not true. Not true, even according to you, Vlad. You give us an example, I think it was in point one, and I don't know if I played it, that Satan, when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, was using the Bible. That's actually the strategy of Satan. That's what he did in the wilderness. He used the Bible out of context. That was your example of how we need to make sure we're taking the Bible in context instead of what Satan did, which was pulling out random scriptures. Satan sounded just like God because he used God's words. So you can't just say Satan will always sound the exact opposite of God, and that's how you can know. If that were the case, no one would ever be deceived by Satan. If God's voice is calm, then Satan's is obsessive. Well, that's easier. Now we're getting somewhere. So if I hear a voice in my head that seems loud, that seems persistent, that's Satan because God is not pushy and he's quiet. Wasn't that just his point in point seven that God will be supernaturally versus how low us and the devil are moving things forward, lining things up? That's not passive. A lot of times you will sense his guidance. The amount of ways in which Vlad has contradicted himself throughout this video is baffling. Again, he's ending with all these things that sound so pretty. Hey, if God's voice convicts, it is Satan who condemns. If it's that simple, we should always know, except maybe sometimes we can't differentiate between condemning and conviction. We're back at our problem that Vlad's video is supposed to address for us. Oh, it's so confusing. Our emotions are so untrustworthy. Don't worry, here's how you can know. When you feel this, you'll feel that. Vlad, stop. <sighs> Sorry, guys. Sorry I got so heated on this one. I'm sad. I'm sad for Christians. I'm sad at the confusion this Bible and this belief system and this fake God has caused you. I'm sad that you have to turn to videos like Vlad's because you're so lost, even though you are so desperately trying. Like if you watched that video, if you spent 23 minutes of your life after doing a search, watching that video, it's because you wanted to be able to do the right thing. You wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. You want to better your relationship with this person who you're supposed to have a relationship with. I empathize. I feel for you. I had that same longing, that same honest desire, and it's for nothing. And you can't actualize. You can't achieve. Christianity won't let you. Go tell anyone in your church you have it down. You always know when God is speaking. You'll be told that you are egotistical and that you've now opened the door for even further deceit from the devil. Tell them, though, you're always struggling. Tell them you can't understand. They'll tell you you need more faith. Tell them you did trust God. You followed all the advice you could. You moved forward under his guidance, but things didn't work out. They'll say, don't blame God. What did you do? Where's your sin? There is no arriving. It's so obvious and so sad. The only deceit that is going on, and I'm not trying to be vicious or mean towards Christians, is self-deceit. This God doesn't exist. If he does exist, he's evil and inconsistent and does not care to have a conversation. And how many chances will you give this God before you say, you're not holding up your end of the bargain? God is simply not communicating, not in the way he used to, not in the way that he says he will. And the apologetics that are trying to bridge that gap are doing just that. They're gap fillers. They're making up for God's lack of existence, or if he exists, lack of honesty communication, and follow through. I implore you and encourage you to take a real look at what you believe about this God and why before you continue to personally harm yourself with the belief about your evil, sinful nature, the impossibility of escaping the devil's hold, all the while while living under God's wrath for getting it so wrong. The fear, the shame, the guilt, and the confusion are avoidable. And it starts with acknowledging maybe this isn't true. So that's all I have for you today. I'm going to redo my intro because I really want you guys to watch this. If you've made it this far, thank you. Please comment. Please share. Let's do all the things. I would love for this to be my biggest video. I'd love to have a real honest conversation with Vlad. And I believe that this is what hurts the Christian most 
in today's day and age. And my goal is to reduce the harm that this religion does. So help me with that mission. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you on Thursday with our next Secular Bible Study series. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My iconoclast, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Oliver, and Sean. My humanist heroes, Jared and Christy. My atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Rocket, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy this kind of content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks and have a great day.